Hello and welcome to our Health Architect Lab for November the 7th. Our topic for today is Diet Strategies for Healing the Gut, which is an extension, kind of a complement to our previous workshop around the vagus nerve and regulating our nervous system. So as we talk about the gut, just know that those are very much interconnected. And the first step we'll talk about actually relates to addressing trauma and nervous system regulation. So this was one of the topics that was voted for, so I hope uh, you find it helpful. The first thing uh, we'll talk about just briefly is why gut health is so important. I feel like most people know that gut health is important. You know, we often talk about it as a foundation for our physical health. But I've given you some specific um, links to research articles that provide evidence, really strong evidence for why the gut health is so important. And I'm sure there's further studies that have come out since I put this material together. So intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut, uh, when the lining of the gut has become more porous or permeable than it normally should be, is very strongly associated with all autoimmune diseases. It's thought to be an underlying process in the development of autoimmune. So think conditions like Hashimoto's, arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, and many others. We know that poor gut health also disrupts sleep and impacts our circadian rhythm. And this is backed by um, articles and evidence as well. There is a strong gut brain connection where gut dysbiosis, so we'll talk about what dysbiosis means in a second here, is actually linked to triggering anxiety and depression and linked to other mental health concerns as well. Gut health is linked to irritable bowel syndrome or IBS and other inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's and colitis. Gut dysbiosis or that imbalance of the gut has also been linked to um, other conditions like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. It's been linked with high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, so cardiovascular and metabolic issues. There's a gut skin connection, Often, you know, in practice, when we're treating skin conditions, the first place that we want to look and address is the gut itself. So think conditions like acne or eczema or psoriasis. And there is a connection with the gut in hormones uh, and aging. So there's a link between the metabolism of sex hormones. Um, the stress hormones are impacted as well. So think insulin, leptin, which we're going to talk about actually a little, a little later. Now, the aim is, um, when it comes to improving gut health, is actually to increase micro uh, microbiome uh, diversity, not just add in more bacteria. So that's a fallacy that we see often, you know, uh, perpetuated by the health gurus and influencers out there is like, you know, take this probiotic, probiotic you need these good bacteria. But that's not always the case. Often it's an imbalance of the different strains of bacteria. Um, and it's, it's, it's a more complex uh, rebalancing process than just adding in a probiotic. So more diversity is really equated with health. And so that, you know, has implications around antibiotic use and especially overuse, so unnecessary use of antibiotics because they're essentially killing off all the bacteria, even the beneficial or um, the, you know, the good strains of bacteria that then decrease this diversity. Okay, so what is dysbiosis? I use that term a couple of times. Dysbiosis essentially means that imbalance of different strains of bacteria in our microbiome, in our gut environment. So it could look like too little of the good guys. So primarily bacteria are going to be populating our large intestine, okay? So that's where we're focused on um, with the beneficial bacteria. We need good gut bacteria for fermenting food, i.e. breaking down food and supporting our immune health. They also produce nutrients like short-chain fatty acids, uh, which are fuel for the gut cells. It helps the gut cells be able to heal themselves and deal with inflammation and B vitamins, uh, which of course are fuel for our cells and to produce energy wherever those cells are located throughout the body. 
that dysbiosis can also refer to too many bacteria in the small intestine, something that's referred to as SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So the small intestine is meant to have relatively low levels of bacteria. Its job is around digestion, not fermentation, which is the process left to the large intestine. So overgrowth is when you have the bacteria from the large intestine having translocated or traveled into the small intestine where they shouldn't belong. And that is another case of dysbiosis or what we mean by the term dysbiosis. So it's thought to... Um, be that about 40% of people with irritable bowel syndrome actually have SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay, now dysbiosis can lead to um, a lot of consequences. One is that overgrowth of harmful or pathogenic microorganisms, be it bacteria, fungal or yeast infections, parasites as well. It just primes an environment that becomes more hospitable to the path pathogenic forms of these microorganisms and inhospitable to the beneficial organisms, microorganisms. Um, the overgrowth can also lead to leaky gut, which we called intestinal permeability. And then intestinal permeability specifically is a loss of these tight junctions between the cells that are lining the gut. So think of the, you know, the, the lining as needing to be solid, um, consistent, and this intestinal permeability happens through dysbiosis or inflammation that damages the lining, making it more porous or permeable than it should be. Essentially, you get these holes in the lining that then allow the contents of the gut to get into the bloodstream where they shouldn't be. So particles cross the gut barrier entering into the bloodstream. And that's the uh, trigger for food intolerances and sensitivities for autoimmunity, like we said earlier, uh, just for the um, allowing uh, inflammation to impact the body systemically. The gut is also the first line of defense of the immune system. The bulk of our immune cells, at least 70% of them, reside in our gut. So dysbiosis can often lead to immune dysfunction or autoimmunity, as we talked about. The majority of immune cells are found in the gut, so it's kind of like the outside meets the inside within the gut. Um, so with the dysbiosis, you're going to have an impact on the immune function as well. Now, what can we do about uh, improving, optimizing, correcting our gut health? I listed 10 steps. These are the, the steps that I would generally follow with a client if I was working one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And you could see the very first one is what we were talking about in our last workshop, addressing psychology, trauma, and stress. So that involves that vagus nerve stimulation that we talked about in the last workshop. Um, there is a huge gut-brain connection. The body needs to feel safe in order to be able to do this healing. So this, to me, is really the necessary step. I would say it's important for everyone to look at. Most people are going to have some degree of stress, some degree of trauma um, unresolved in their body. So it's a necessary step, I think, for everyone. The, the second step is around eating in a manner that's going to help to regulate blood sugar. And specifically, we're talking about our stress hormones here, insulin and leptin. Um, so if there is a state of insulin resistance and or leptin resistance in the body, it will put stress on the gut. And then gut health, gut imbalances are known to also trigger insulin resistance and leptin resistance. Um, so it's a bit of a, a chicken egg scenario, but for our purposes, we know because it's so impactful, we definitely want to address that uh, concurrently or at the same time. And I'll go into more details about how we do this in a moment, but I'm just listing um, the steps out first. The third one is to address sleep, so our circadian rhythm. This kind of goes in uh, you know, conjunction with step five, getting sunlight. It's all about syncing our circadian rhythm and these natural you know, rhythms to match up with Mother Earth. Um, step four is to address toxins, so really, really important. And this is often where testing uh, is required, so you could see which toxins are being housed in your body. But a lot of toxins, especially mycotoxins coming from mold, often will get stored in our gut, and they wreak havoc there. 
these toxins, including environmental toxins, um, uh, heavy metals, can all be stored in the gut, triggering inflammation and then wreaking havoc on, on our gut health. Getting time in nature uh, basically goes along with circadian rhythm too, but here we're specifically talking about grounding. Uh, physical activity is important. Um, you know, in the collective, we often refer to it as joyful movement um, rather than, you know, uh, putting a lot of stress on the body. This could be as simple as taking like a leisurely walk after a meal. That's what we're talking about here. And then eight, nine, and 10. And, you know, you notice here we're not talking about any specific diets or dietary restriction until the very bottom of the list. Okay, so that's important. Um, you want to go through steps one to seven first, create that foundation for yourself. And in a lot of cases, just by doing that, you're going to avoid the need to have to go through steps eight to 10. Often it's only in very um, progressed or more severe conditions, like inflammatory bowel conditions, for example, where we eat, where we even need to look at steps eight to ten. So just keep that in mind that you don't jump to steps eight, nine, and ten. Um, oftentimes, that restriction and dietary changes um, they're not they're not necessarily the bulk of your action plan. They don't need to be the main focus of the action plan. But in some cases, it is um, beneficial to identify food intolerances or sensitivities. So in those cases, you know, you could be eating these foods that are triggering inflammation just because that leaky gut is present. So until that leaky gut is healed and that process is no longer, you know, happening, you probably would want to avoid those foods that are triggering inflammation. But the goal is always to get to a place where then your body, you know, is able to handle those foods. It's not the food that is the root cause or, you know, what came ultimately the furthest upstream. Okay. Um, in some cases, there are times when you also need to avoid lectins and we'll talk about what lectins are but they're primarily found in foods like legumes nuts and seeds these can often be a cause for leaky gut syndrome so again if that process is in development or is active sometimes you need to do these temporary um, action steps in order to halt that process from you know uh, progressing further and in some cases, right, in very severe cases of SIBO or small intestinal bacterial growth, um, there is a need to avoid what are called FODMAPs, and we'll get to those in a moment as well. But really, the how, so how you go about addressing those above 10 steps needs to be bespoke, right? It needs to be personalized, informed by your unique health context. All right, so most people, I mean, you can definitely go, you know, steps one to seven. Um, a lot of times you can do um, a, a lot of that on your own. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're looking at addressing toxins, if you're looking at regulating blood sugar, and especially if you're getting into steps eight, nine, and 10, I highly recommend working with a practitioner who is skilled in these areas to support you through those through those steps and ensure that you're taking the right action at the right time you know that's in highest service for you so let's go through each of these steps and what that could look like so step one we talked uh, a lot about in our previous workshop around the vagus nerve stimulation so everything that we mentioned there uh, you can um, include in step one here um, you know, unfortunately, many people go straight to taking a pill or a supplement. We gave the example of, you know, taking a probiotic to heal the gut. That's very reductionistic, and it really is based on an outdated medical model. It doesn't work. It may provide some temporary relief, but you won't get long-term um, resolution of the condition if you're approaching it that way. So there's many dietary, psychological, and lifestyle factors that are pillars of health and all of them affect our gut, okay? So they need to be considered before you reach for a probiotic or a similar supplement. 
um, stress, as we said, which includes the understimulation of the vagus nerve. Um, maybe it's not putting self-care practices in place, PTSD, developmental trauma, right? All these things are um, sources of stress on the body, which can trigger inflammation. So I would say stress has as much of an impact, probably more, on the gut than food. And that's why this is listed as step one. Okay, again, there's some research evidence to support this. You know, stress and trauma can cause leaky gut, can change the microbiome, so it can trigger dysbiosis, can trigger immunosuppression, um, decreased intestinal mucous membrane, uh, which can lead to leaky gut, decreased blood flow to the intestinal tract, suppression of stomach acid, so causing indigestion and heartburn. Uh, slowing of the stomach and small intestinal uh, mobility, so constipation as an example. All right, so that's huge. Um, we have lots of resources within the community to help with addressing stress. Um, there's the mind and social modules inside the classroom. Your bioenergetic scans are going to be an excellent resource because they're specific for you. So especially that mind-body section where it looks at the holograms, the impact of of trauma on your on your body on your um, biofield your energetic um, aspect really really important when addressing um, this aspect of stress okay so that's step number one we have tools like the safe and sound protocol um, and all the techniques and tools that we talked about around the vagus nerve to address that all right so that's going to be specific for again your context Step two uh, is around addressing blood sugar. So balancing blood sugar, which usually, like if we're just, you know, talking about really like basic, um, looking at this very basically, it involves cutting out refined sugar, right? Eating less starchy and refined and processed carbohydrates. Um, and that will help to increase the microbiome diversity. So if you remember at the very beginning, we talked about how higher diversity equals better health. and there's a really nice study um, found in the journal Nature, which showed that higher protein vegetables and fruit, so decreased unhealthy fats, decreased unhealthy carbs, so refined sugars, breads primarily, increase microbial diversity it's very significantly. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to bring in a note about leptin resistance because I see this is often going hand in hand with poor gut health. So leptin, if, if you haven't heard of that, it's a hormone. It's produced primarily by fat cells, although other cells in our body too. And it plays a role, a really important role in energy balance. And it's the hormone that can inhibit our hunger. So it communicates with the hypothalamus, which is a gland in our brain, that's going to signal um, satiety. So it signals to our, our gut that, yeah, we're, we're full, we're good. And it impacts energy storage levels. Okay, so think of the storage that's necessary to run all those processes in our body. So it's very much tied in with the mitochondria as well. Leptin resistance, okay, occurs when the body cells become less responsive to leptin signals, despite their being elevated a levels of leptin in the bloodstream. So it's essentially the same as insulin resistance, it's just leptin in this case. You have the body cells becoming less sensitive, so um, they're not picking up on the fact that leptin is in the bloodstream at nice high levels to be used, okay? And what that, ha what that causes is uh, the brain to misinterpret the body's energy status, which in results in increased hunger and decreased energy expenditure, okay? So basically, the brain behaves as if the body is in the state of starvation, which it isn't, and that triggers overeating, and then as a result, potential weight gain, and you know all those consequences that can happen from overeating. And usually when people are overeating, they're not eating healthy and that what is i think is the piece that goes hand in hand with gut health then you start to be eating these foods that are going to be more inflammatory or pro-inflammatory so you know the exact mechanisms behind leptin resistance are very complex there's a lot of different pathways involved and probably it's not entirely understood at this point 
but just to kind of focus on how this could tie in with the gut. We know that that dysbiosis, so that state of imbalance of the different species of bacteria, eventually leads to intestinal permeability or leaky gut. That leads to this low-grade chronic uh, inflammation, right? It, it's allowed to get from the gut into the bloodstream. And that inf inflammation then interferes with leptin signaling, which then can trigger the leptin resistance. So that's one pathway that can happen. Another one is through the fact that there's this huge gut-brain connection that we talked about. So gut bacteria are actually producing neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA. 90% of serotonin, which is their feel-good molecule, is actually produced by the gut in by the bacteria in our gut. So these hormones, sorry, these neurotransmitters rather can influence mood and our eating behaviors, and that indirectly affects leptin function as well. And we know that these pro-inflammatory diets, so diets that are high in unhealthy fats and refined sugars, promote inflammation, promote the growth of pro-inflammatory bacteria, which triggers that dysbiosis, which then you know brings us up into that first pathway that leads to leptin resistance. Another potential factor is that certain gut bacteria ferment dietary fiber to produce what are called short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids, like I said earlier, think of those as fuel or food for the gut cells. The gut cells need those to be able to heal themselves to resolve inflammation. So essentially, that then creates another um, environment that's more hospitable to the bad guys, to the non-beneficial bacteria, and then over time will influence leptin signaling as well. So as I said, it's a bit of a chicken-egg scenario. Leptin resistance impacts gut health, and gut health can impact leptin resistance. Um, which came first? Really, you're not going to know, uh, you know, in... Uh, you know, a, a, a client situation. But for our purposes, I would say it doesn't matter which came first. Uh, you want to first rule in or out leptin resistance. And if it's present, I would say address it, um, you know, as part of this second step. So in order to check if you are leptin resistant, um, one obvious red flag is if you are overweight or obese. So if you are over like 25 pounds um, overweight, you can essentially assume that there is leptin resistance there. Um, but doesn't mean even if you're at, you know, quote unquote, um, normal weight, you don't have leptin resistance. So that's where the blood chemistry comes in. Um, all of these markers will be elevated to some degree. So um, thyroid function comes into play here, specifically what's called reverse T3. You can actually assess your leptin specifically, salivary cortisol, so our stress hormone there. Typically, it's going to be like the opposite pattern that you want to see. So your cortisol should be high in the morning and lower in the evening when you're trying to sleep. So you're going to see that op opposite pattern happening where you have low cortisol in the morning and higher levels before bedtime. Um, High ferritin, which is a marker of how much iron your body is storing. And then CRP, specifically high sensitivity CRP, is important to assess. Um, and that's an inflammatory marker. So it's a marker of inflammation. And interestingly, this one is associated with the length of time that it generally takes to be able to address the leptin resistance. So the higher the CRP, the higher the inflammation, the longer that leptin resistance reset will take. Now, if you do confirm the presence of leptin resistance and or blood sugar um, dysregulation, I highly recommend checking out the book, The Epi Paleo Prescription by Dr. Jack Cruz for more details. So he lays out a really specific plan that you can follow. Um, I included some of the key points here. Um, so if you're not sure, but you have a sense of there being potential blood sugar dysregulation, I feel like you could start with these without even knowing for sure and still get lots of benefit. People even without blood sugar dysregulation can benefit from um, these points, okay? Because they're all going to go towards supporting a healthy metabolism, which in turn will then support healthy 
hormones and hormone regulation. So um, really key to eat breakfast within 30 minutes upon waking um, to get that metabolism going. Protein rich breakfast is important. So protein, like that's the amino acids. It's the building blocks for protein in the body, building blocks for life, really. When you're starting off, so especially if there is confirmation of this leptin resistance, you, you do require a higher amount of protein and you do want to be mindful of the amount that you're getting. So um, it's recommended 50 to 70 grams. If you know you don't have that leptin resistance or it's just around regulating blood sugar, um, just ensure that the bulk of the breakfast is more focused on the proteins. No snacking, so you do want to stick with like three main meals per day, leaving four to five hours between meals. If you're snacking throughout the, the day, that does do a number on the liver. It puts a lot of stress on the liver, and the liver is involved with the you know the leptin metabolism, really the the metabolism of all our hormones. So starting with three meals a day, and oftentimes people notice that as their hunger and as their cravings diminish, they often will go to two meals a day and feel actually really good by doing that. Um, not working out or doing any strenuous physical activity before or after breakfast. The reason for that is we don't want to drive cortisol higher or put more stress on an already stressed system. So if you have confirmation that your cortisol levels are out of whack, so to speak, or there is the the presence of adrenal fatigue, um, that's an important piece. Working out after 5 p.m. is more ideal because then that will support stimulation of fat burning while you're sleeping. So a little later in the day, not necessarily right before bed, but after 5 p.m. Avoiding artificial or blue lights after the sun sets is really key to regulate our circadian rhythm. Um, and then allowing at least three to four hours between your last meal and before you go to sleep so that your body has time to transition from focusing on digestion to preparing your body for sleep itself. Eating according to the season is a really big one, especially as it relates to produce or fruits and vegetables. You know, um, where we're living, you know, here in Canada, we're not supposed to be eating a lot of tropical fruit, for example, during the winter. It's just not accessible to us and absolutely will throw off our blood sugar regulation. So the diet itself is made up of lots of good quality proteins and fats. So, you know, think grass-fed meats, pastured um, eggs, tallow, um, coconut oil, olive oil, um, grass-fed butter, etc. Liberal use of seafood broths and bone broths, which are excellent for addressing leaky gut syndrome and just creating that uh, environment in the gut that's hospitable for the good bacteria. And fermented vegetables, which act like prebiotics, order the food for the good bacteria as well. So those are some, I, I would say, relatively simple steps that one could take if you um, suspect blood sugar dysregulation or leptin resistance. Um, and then I would recommend getting that confirmed um, through testing if necessary. Step three is to address sleep. Um, so a couple of research studies here in research of night shift workers and those that were subject to jet lag. So think, um, you know, uh, pilots, um, uh, flight workers, disrupted sleep rhythm will result in change in their gut bacterial balance. So in that diversity, and uh, they were shown to have increased possibility of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and abdominal pain. And then uh, another study was shown uh, showed that changes in gut bacteria resulted in weight gain and higher blood sugar. So what, essentially what we were just talking about. So with the sleep, I mean, we've gone over this um, extensively. There's a lot to be found in the environment module. This all ties into circadian rhythm management. So if, you know, you're someone that's starting out, I put a couple of really simple steps, I think, that would help with uh, addressing this one. Avoiding art, the artificial blue lights um, for a good two hours if you can prior to falling asleep. You know, starting this especially after the sun sets. So focusing on um, candlelight, you know, uh, firelight, these types of um, lights that are not as bright, uh, natural light, uh, really, really important for sleep 
um, because if you're getting the artificial blue lights, um, what happens is it tricks the brain again. So, you know, that light hits the pineal gland and it tells it to say, oh, you don't need to produce the melatonin. We're not preparing ourselves for sleep yet. It's still daytime, right? You want the opposite happening. And then that combined with the sunlight exposure within 30 minutes of waking, i.e. exposing, exposing your eyes to the light is one of the best things to regulate cortisol and ensure that it's not going high at bedtime when you want it to be nice and low. So these two steps to me are foundational, really good starting places. A lot of people that have sleep issues, if they just do those, they're going to notice benefit. And often you don't need to you know, resort to um, like sleep supplements or sleep medication. Step four is addressing toxins. So um, smoking has been found to negatively affect the microbiome of people specifically with Crohn's disease. Stopping smoking, so smoking cessation, change the microbiome profoundly and almost immediately, like it happened really quickly in that study. Uh, it's been shown that air pollution can make its way to the intestines and changes the microbiota. There's lots of toxins that can impact the gut. We talked about mycotoxins, environmental toxins, heavy metals, any and all of those will wreak havoc on the gut and the beneficial bacteria. Um, glyphosate, for example, which is found in pesticides, um, it's sprayed on crops, has been shown to kill off specific strains of bacteria like lactobacillus. So there's lots, lots of evidence for that. We know that that's just the case now. So um, for this one, I do highly recommend testing if you can. Um, the Total Tox Burden Panel is the one that I recommend through Vibrant uh, America Labs. So there's a link here that'll take you to um, my website so you can order it specifically through me if you like. All right, so that's the Total Tox Burden here. And if you scroll down, it gives you um, a one pager that tells you a little bit of information of like why this testing is important. And then also you can check out a sample report to see actually uh, specifically what is tested in, in this one. It's a urine test, so it's non-invasive. You can do it at home. It's a one-time urine collection. Um, but you could see, I'll just pull it up a little bit here. There are various kinds of environmental toxins, including pesticides, herbicides, phthalates, uh, which are found in plastics, parabens, which are found in a lot of cosmetics and personal care products, everything from acrylic metabolites to volatile organic compounds, um, all of that's included. And then we also have our mycotoxins. So these are toxins from mold, and it covers both ones that could be coming from contaminated food, i.e. we ingest, and also ones that are environmentally sourced, like found in water-damaged homes or environments. And then all the heavy metals are also assessed. So from aluminum to lead to mercury to cadmium, etc., all of those are included here. So simple, like one-time collection of urine can give you all that information. And then the benefit with doing the testing is that you know specifically what toxins are present in your body and you could be much more laser focused. Um, so removing a mycotoxin requires a different plan than removing say a phthalate or a heavy metal. So each of those toxins requires a specific binder um, that will bind you know, to them to allow the easy removal from your body. Um, so that, you know, again, is, is something I, I do recommend working with a practitioner who does this type of testing and is skilled at supporting you through that process. But we also have information in the environment model, in the classroom and the collective, you know, things around cleaning your home, looking for toxins, you know, how to read these um, ingredient labels so you know which ones are um, affecting you that you're, you know, exposing yourself to on a regular basis. Step five is to get time in the sun. Um, so low vitamin D has been shown to decrease gut flora um, and also affect leaky gut syndrome. So 
again, this is something that we've talked about. We even had a, a workshop around this. So I would say, you know, revisit that environment module, um, specifically around the light strategies. Sunlight is the best, by far the best um, option for vitamin D, much better than resorting to um, a supplement. Getting time in nature. So this one is all about grounding. Um, there's some research around this, interestingly enough. So a uh, paper back in 2013 showed that living closer to agricultural lands and actually opening the window increased bacterial diversity on the skin, so less incidence of skin conditions. Um, other research looked at two groups of teens, so those that had allergic skin disorders, think eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, compared to those with healthy skin. And they noted that the teens with skin disorders had a lower diversity of plant life in their homes. Okay, so again, exposure to microbiota bacteria in our environment, right? This idea that, you know, as kids, it's actually good to eat sand or eat dirt and, um, you know, expose ourselves to these forms of bacteria to prime our gut to, um, you know, uh, create uh, an environment that's going to be hospitable for more of these good bacteria. So the authors hypothesized that rich environmental bacterial bacteria influences healthy bacteria on your skin, and then this influences your immune system. Okay. So um, there's a book called Eat Dirt as well that goes into this and the importance of being in nature, exposing yourself to the bacteria that exists in nature for improving our gut health as well. Step seven is to address exercise as best you can. So this, this is going to be very individualized, um, but there is good research to show that exercise, protein consumption, um, resulted in a healthier microbiome in the gut. Um, so, you know, again, we have information in the, uh, the classroom around this. I would say as a really nice starting step for most people, it could look um, or be as simple as a leisurely 15 to 20 minute walk post meal, right? So it doesn't have to be, you know, a strenuous exercise or something. You don't even have to think about going at a good pace, just a leisurely walk after, um, especially your largest meal of the day. So for most people, that's probably dinner time. Um, you know, with our approach, we're always talking about joyful movement too. So it, you know, it wasn't found to be any specific type of exercise. So just to note that, um, so some is better than none and whatever you enjoy doing. So if it's dancing, if it's yoga, like whatever that is, it will have a positive impact on gut health, you know, as we're talking about in, 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 in this context. So after this, we're getting into some more specific recommendations. Um, so again, I would highly recommend working with a practitioner around these last three steps, okay? So step eight is addressing food intolerances or food sensitivities. We do have testing, it's called the Food Zoomers. Um, they're through Vibrance uh, Wellness Labs as well. And I like this because it's much more comprehensive than the typical IgG testing that you would get on a lot of, you know, through a lot of practitioners. Um, I'll just let that load. Um, and then you can figure out specifically what foods your body is reacting to or having difficulty digesting. And then you would avoid those foods while you're healing your gut, not for the long term. The idea is always to bring those foods back or get your body to a place where they're able to eat them, you know, without issue again. Another resource that you have access to being a member of our community is your bioenergetic scans. So there's a whole nutrition uh, section in the bioenergetic scan, a wealth of information there, including specifically around food sensitivities. So you want to look for orange or purples that are staying high, staying as orange or purples over a prolonged period of time. So essentially after three or four scans. And then that's really good evidence for, um, you know, the, that you're probably reacting to that food. Uh, in that case, you could say, 
uh, very reasonably, okay, let me avoid that food for a period of time while I'm working on healing my gut and see if that, you know, results in benefit. So as I've been saying, food intolerance testing should only be considered once the previous steps have been completed, okay? So it's important to heal the leaky gut first or at least concurrently while you're doing this type of a step, okay? And if you don't have like the resources to be able to do the testing, you could consider doing an elimination diet. But again, I would say work with a practitioner um, in, in order to go through that so you know that you're doing it um, in the right way. So foods that are triggering inflammation um, will affect your diversity and can trigger um, or can influence the you get further. The you get would, would have been there already, but then it can make things worse, so to speak. A food may be a pre prebiotic and feed good bacteria like gluten grains, um, but if you're reactive to that food, then it's going to negatively impact you, right? So foods that are going to be beneficial for one person may not necessarily be beneficial for you and vice versa. The most powerful thing you can do to improve your gut health though is to learn to listen to your own body. Literally, what is your gut telling you? And stop listening to everyone else, all right? Because what, you know, as I said, what is beneficial for one person doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be beneficial for you. So listen to your gut, listen to your intuition, that is always right. So, you know, the idea, and you see this in the online health space a lot, the idea that you must follow a paleo or lectin-free or low keto diet or carnivore diet or a vegetarian diet, you know, that some expert is, is telling you to, to do is simply not true. The most important thing is to explore uh, what your body needs, like what you're needing yourself. Now, that being said, there are some more common food intolerances or sensitivities, and I've listed those for you. So if you feel like oh, this might be a concern for me, maybe have a look at that list and, and say, okay, am I noticing anything when I eat those foods specifically? And am I noticing any signs or symptoms shortly after eating those foods or within one to two hours of eating those foods? So gluten sensitivity, um, I mean, it's been a hot topic more recently. There's a lot of mainstream science papers now confirming gluten sensitivity as being a major issue in a subgroup of people. So as of this time anyway, there's 19,000 papers just in English on celiac disease, even though worldwide it's estimated about 1% of the population has it. Now, the thing with celiac disease by the time you get diagnosed, that means you're kind of in the pathology state. It's like later stages of the illness. So the majority of people with gluten sensitivity are not going to have any gut symptoms. So celiac disease, or what we're talking about here, this gluten sensitivity, is vastly underdiagnosed for that reason. Okay, You don't have to be diagnosed with celiac to have a sensitivity. More often, there's already changes happening, and it's just not at the path um, pathology stage. So celiac just means that you have total villus atrophy. So the villi are the little um, microtubules that line the gut. And what that means, by the time you get diagnosed with celiac disease, that those have been completely damaged. Right, like I said, that's end stage. You don't want to necessarily be, um, pardon me, you don't want to be diagnosed with celiac disease. So there's a lot um, of time before you get to that stage where you could be proactive and been taking action to reverse that. Okay. Now you can have partial villus atrophy, atrophy which doesn't test positive for celiac disease as well. Um, or what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So to differentiate between those, that's where the testing comes in. You could do a test like the gut zoomer, again, through Vibrant uh, Wellness Labs um, that has assessment for, um, for gluten um, in, in it. Or um, 
one of the zoomers ha is a wheat zoomer and that goes into even greater detail about what you could be sensitive to All right so we know that gluten causes inflammation in the gut and intestinal permeability um, even in those without a genetic propensity for autoimmunity so it really could affect anyone and everyone Estimates have shown that about 0.5 to 13% of the population may have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, that number is probably even higher now. So, I mean, there is the question here, are we more sensitive now to gluten than we were in the past? It seems like this thing that's a, a more recent phenomenon, right? You didn't talk about gluten sensitivity years ago. Um, so there was a study done of over nine thousand blood samples and this was specifically with participants at Warren Air, Air Force Base in Wyoming uh, between these years and the samples were tested for autoantibodies to gluten and then compared to age or birth year okay and that was matched um, so it was age or birth year matched uh, recently collected from um, uh, Minnesota so researchers found that young people today are 4.5 more times likely to have celiac disease than those young people back in the 1950s. Okay, so why is that? Well, the head researcher um, for the study said that celiac disease is unusual, but it's no longer rare. Some something has changed in our environment to account for that vast increase. So um, Dr. Murray thinks maybe genetic modification is playing a role, uh, right? With the, the crops are, uh, are tried to be made to be hardier, shorter, you know, better growing plants. Um, so it's through that genetic uh, modification, GMOs. Um, a lot of it is because of the processing, right? Many of the processed foods that we eat actually were not even in existence 50 years ago. Okay. Um, the vast majority of wheat grown in the US and Europe is now GMO. And the majority of corn, 88%, probably even more now, and 93% of soy is all GMO. So it is very, very difficult to get natural sources of wheat, corn, and soy in North America. Okay, so the vast amount, especially in the processed packaged foods, is going to be genetically modified, right? And so there's something to be said that our guts have not evolved to a place where we're able to break that down, you know, those, these less than natural forms. Okay, and then there's dairy. So, I mean, beyond lactose intolerance, lactose intolerance definitely is a thing about 65% of adults have reduced ability to digest lactose. Um, but dairy itself, like the A1 dairy that we get in the grocery store for the most part, is full of hormones and chemicals. Uh, one study found that 20 different pharma pharmacologically active substances were found in cow, goat, and human breast milk. And drugs seem to be the most, com most common. So that's just crazy. All right, so that's um, step eight. And then step nine is to remove the lectins. So lectins are proteins from plants. So they're found in these foods primarily. I'll talk about eggs. Eggs do not have lectins in them, but there's a reason that we include them in the list here. But lectins are proteins uh, from plants that bind to carbohydrates and glycoproteins. So what they do is they basically glob on to the lining of the gut and potentially can contribute to the development of leaky gut syndrome. They're highest in legumes, nuts, and seeds, and then to a lesser degree in your nightshades. Um, so eggs, as I said, are not high in lectins, but you can develop a temporary reaction to egg protein if you have leaky gut um, and have been on a high lectin diet when you're sensitive to them. So it's a bit complicated there, but the idea that is if you're noticing you are sensitive to lectins and still are not having like the full benefit, you could look at eggs uh, as a possibility, okay? Um, so the low lectin diet 
primarily has been used to address autoimmunity. So that's when it seems to have the most benefit. And there have been studies done to show its significance, especially in the case of inflammatory bowel disease. So again, we're talking more about more severe concerns like Crohn's and colitis. I would say, you know, consider this as a step if you're in um, that stage or if that's applicable for you. And some more um, research around what lectins can potentially do and the consequence of eating a lot of lectins. So I'll just let you peruse that on your own. All right, so if you're considering a paleo autoimmune diet, so to the degree that you're going to be avoiding inflammatory foods along with the lectins, I would say, you know, do it for a maximum of three to four weeks. So it's not a plan that you're going to be doing long term. You do it for a period of time and gauge how well you feel while you're on it. Um, you know, if it's not something that you notice benefit by doing, you move on. It's not something that you're going to stick with for a long period of time. Okay. Um, yeah, so don't obsess. There is definitely more to autoimmunity than diet. I think that's a really important point. There's so many other factors, especially stress. So, you know, those other initial steps are really, really important to complete before you get to the stage. And similar, you know, I'll say it for step 10, the low FODMAP diet for SIBO. Um, use a test like the gut zoomer to confirm the presence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth before you consider a low FODMAP diet. So inform the, the need for it by testing. And then if there is the need, you do the test, you, you do the, um, the diet rather for um, a short term period of time. So FODMAPs are foods that feed bacteria. Um, they are high in prebiotic um, properties. Normally, you know, you, you want to feed your gut bacteria. However, if the small intestine, as we said, is, um, is, is having a lot of those bacteria that have traveled or translocated where they shouldn't be, then you're feeding bacteria or contributing to the overgrowth. So you want to stop that process from happening, which is what the reasoning behind avoiding the FODMAPs. Okay. Um, so FODMAPs include things like fructose, lactose, fructans, galactans, and so on. Um, there's one study that showed people with fibromyalgia were shown to improve on a, a low FODMAP diet. Again, do this in conjunction like with a practitioner, practitioner that's skilled in um, this type of, of type of therapy. More research around the FODMAP diet. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I think it's very um, specific and an individual. So hopefully the vast majority of people are not going to need to resort to a FODMAP diet. But if you do, I, the one that I like is called the biphasic SIBO diet. Um, it's specifically formulated or created to address SIBO. And I find it is very effective at doing that if it is something that um, is impacting you. Now, it was interesting to note that I did find this study that showed hypnotherapy works better or equal to FODMAPs for IBS. So again, um, reserve these more restrictive diets to severe cases, okay? Inflammatory bowel conditions, severe cases of SIBO. Most people do not need to resort to these overly restrictive diets. Okay, so a low FODMAP diet is not a long-term diet. It's not something that you stay on for months and months. Okay, you get to the point where you've improved the health of your gut and you start reintroducing um, the foods back into your diet. And also, I mean, there are different reasons that overgrowth happens in the small intestine. And so it could be related to low thyroid function, uh, vagus nerve dysregulation, low stomach acid production, you know, stress, all these other factors, right, that you want to take into consideration and address. So it's not just the diet. The diet or diet restriction um, by no means is the, the be-all, end-all. And, you know, with all of this, if you're not better, you mean, kind of trying to do this on your own, one, work with a, a practitioner, and then two, test, don't guess. So this is where the testing can come into play and be a real benefit 
you could see exactly what's there. Do I have a pathogen? You know, are there toxins affecting uh, my gut health? You know, how is my digestion? And then you use that information to inform your specific, you know, bespoke action plan. And that's a much um, more effective approach, I find, than, you know, throwing all, you know, this stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, so to speak, or going about it as a, a trial and error approach. All right, so um, that concludes the workshop around dietary strategies for healing gut health. I hope you found that beneficial. If you have any questions following, you know, viewing this material, feel free to post those in the community and I'm happy to address, the, address them there. As well, feel free to bring them to our Creation Catalyst calls and I'm happy to answer them there. Uh, let me know. Where are you at personally around your gut health? What stage are uh, may you be addressing? Uh, you know, leave those comments below this video. I'd love to hear. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day.